Bexy, thank you so much for joining us for an Audible Sessions interview about your brand new book, Cult Following. Thanks for having me. What can people expect if they're picking up this book? They can expect part adventure, road trip, um, uh, two, two girls and a couple of others going in a truck and exploring the underbelly of the world of cults in America. And then the other part is the story of me as a child that intertwines with this grown-up version of myself um, who grew up in potentially one of the most infamous cults that has existed. The, the cult that you grew up in, it's called Children of God. It's changed its name a few times now, mm. but give us an introduction as to kind of who they are. If I talk about it from the perspective of me as a child, it was uh, growing up in, in secret, in communes that were all over the world that uh, we as children had no control over. We had essentially a dictator that, you know, di that was in charge of our every single move every day. Obviously, as an adult, I can look at it from more of a the perspective of what you could read in the papers or, or what you could read online, which is a group that started in the 60s that was led by a man that started off making people believe that he was a prophet and then turned into a, an absolutely deviant predator. And what was that day-to-day -day like as a child? in that situation? I suppose this just the feeling of oppression and not knowing, you know, and we didn't know what was outside of our gate. For example, I think most people when they, when they look at cults, they think of these, you know, this otherworldly thing that maybe exists only in America or on compounds in the middle of the desert. You know, at some points I was growing up at just outside of Birmingham and rugby and places like that that are on our doorstep here. It sounds like, you know, escape to the countryside rather than it does, you know, an exploration of UK cults. But yeah, for growing up in it, it was, you know, we the children were the workforce. We were the ones who supported the group. But within that, we were also completely controlled. There's a pretty horrific, I was going to say chapter in the book, but experience of your life um, where you were put on silent restriction and you weren't allowed to speak or make eye contact with anyone unless, you know, an adult said that that, that was OK for, for a really long time. How did you as a 10 year old get through that? How did that, what was your mental health like at that time? When I think back to that time, and I do, I think I, I do kind of detail what you could describe now potentially as a bit of an unraveling as a 10 year old, when I kind of start asking God to break me because I feel that that must be the only way to get through what I'm going through. I can't be right. Everyone around me can't be wrong. That, that is, if you look at it from the perspective of us in this room now and as adults, we go, that's a child having a meltdown. That's a child having an absolute kind of, breakdown so you know um, and if I'm being completely honest I think there are a lot of kids who didn't get through the tortures which is the only way that I can destroy describe the machinations of the adults of you know the, the the constructs that they put us within the things they did to break us down to, to, to stop us from rebelling you know it was forms of torture there was a friend that you had for a time in the in the children of god um called maria yes what why was that connection so important and what was that connection like so to describe maria is to describe my soulmate essentially i went from being this kid who hadn't had any kind of human contact for a year while being within a commune of massive proportions so the contrast of those two things you you are in a bustling house but you feel like you are in a cell because you aren't allowed to have eye contact or speak or smile or even react to someone dropping a plate for example and then I moved to another commune and I was still on sinus restriction and there was a girl within it who was also on sinus restriction but we got to a point at um at this really young age of just realizing like I saw a wildness in her eyes which was uh, the rebellion on the cusp and we had we were told to share a bed and that night that we shared a bed she literally just said one word to me and that was hey and I hadn't actually had a kid speak to me in a year and it was that moment in the dark that was again my this this moment of connection I mean what the, what the capability of having someone witness what you're going through can do for you is just incredible. And, you know, that, that in that moment within that group is when, you know, it, it changed for me. Maria left the cult slightly earlier than you did. Yes. I mean, I was so relieved that she got out. That was my first thing. I was devastated that she went. You know, I think I, I, I did slip into a depression after she left because she was my, she was my person. The minute she was gone, I was like, no. 
no. And I went from being a kid that was, you know, okay to be, you know, towing the line and being all of the stuff that I kept secret um, it, inside myself. All of a sudden, that just turned into hatred and rebellion. And I was like, no, nah, I'm getting out of here. And that's when I started to, to do rebellious things like, um, you know, hang out with kids from the village, which in itself is such a weird thing when I look back on it. Them probably wanting to hang out with me because they were like, oh my God, here's the sex cult girl. And me experiencing my first kind of forays into the outside world and what it had to offer and, you know, hearing Rage Against the Machine for the first time and trying my first cigarette all while I was still within this commune. You mentioned obviously the fact that people referred to it as a as a sex cult. Yes. We haven't really touched on why that is. Can you explain briefly yeah. why? Yeah, of course. Um, the David Berg, the leader, Father David, Moses David, his his multiple names. He one of his kind of probably most standout beliefs. I mean, he believed in so many things, but one of his most standout beliefs was the idea that the that there is one law and that's love. And that mutated into so many things. It mutated into the mums in the houses becoming prostitutes to support the homes, but with this idea of giving the Lord's love, Jesus' love through the medium of sex in nightclubs and bars and things like that, So, which was called flirty fishing. And that was a big part of it. But the other side of it was he was, he was, he was himself a sexual predator, but also kind of provocated this idea of that uh, as long as it's done in love, you can have sex with children and you can marry children with a with a piece that he called uh, that was called child bride. And your parents, they weren't so involved in that part. But what what were they like, and how did they get kind of hooked into all of this? You know, I have this very simple line in the in the book, which is why did how did David Berg trick my parents? And it's a really reductionist line. It's you know, it, it's almost childlike in a way. But I, that's what I was trying to understand. Like my my parents met on a psychiatric ward, and you know, you might think that that's because they were you know wearing you know gowns and you know eating pharmaceuticals together, because that's where a lot of people seem to think that you know people who come who join cults have mental health problems and actually it's the opposite it can be middle class people who come from you know what we want to call good homes which was my parents they were in the mental that the in the psychiatric ward because they um my dad was studying to be a psychiatric nurse and my mum was studying to be a psychologist you know smart people on scholarships at universities who then joined this group that you know has become the rest of their lives one of the reasons that i wanted to do the the adult journey of this, of mm. going around and joining all of these groups in uh, in America, etc., was because what were the com- what were the commonalities between adults that want to join groups? And from that point, I can see you know it's very simple, basic human needs. It's the need for connection, the need for community, to find our people, to feel that we have purpose. Those are things we can all relate to. They're not that far away from us than th- that that we might think. It has been such a pleasure to talk to you and it was, like, the book is a brilliant thing to read. Um, So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.